Now we turn to the comments of Jack Stutter uh, from the University of Paris. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is this good? Okay. I will uh, begin. I would like to begin by thanking Allison for this very intricate analysis of Spinoza. I think that we can all appreciate the importance of such an approach. One, am I speaking too quickly? I'm sorry. Um, je m'excuse déjà. Uh, je commence. Uh, je vais parler pas trop rapidement, j'espère. Je vais parler en anglais. Uh, et, uh, mais dites-moi si je parle trop vite. Comme ça, je me ralentis. Et d'ailleurs, si vous voulez lire le texte, c'est en ligne. Il faut avoir envoyé un mail à Charles pour être sur le drive. Mais il est là. Donc, uh, bon, je vais essayer de parler lentement. Je vais recommencer, excusez-moi. So, uh, thank you, Alison. I would like to uh, begin by thanking Alison for this very intricate analysis of Spinoza. I think that we can all appreciate the importance of such an approach, one that takes it upon itself to in no way underestimate the complexity of Spinoza's text, and that, as a result, does not fool us into thinking that Spinoza is an easy philosopher. Personally, I've always found part two of the ethics the most difficult of all, so it should come as no surprise that I appreciate Alison's vigilance. I would also like to note that this level of attentiveness seems to me quite characteristic of American readings of Spinoza at their finest. What I myself would like to offer in way of a response is an exploration, and as it were unfolding, of the implicit importance of the object of Allison's talk, Spinoza's theory, or as I must now say, theories, of embodiment. That is to say that I would like us to zoom out to see what is at stake more globally. However, before getting to this, I would like to bring out something that I think we might otherwise risk overlooking, namely that Allison's paper is as much a study of Spinoza's doctrines of embodiment, especially from E2 P7 through E2 P13, as it is a study of Spinoza's general method, and that what she shows us is that for a study of Spinoza's method to be thorough, it must be attuned to its finest details. One will recall that Ferdinand Arquier, in his uh, classic work, Le Rationalisme de Spinoza, did much the same, Generally speaking, both Alquier and Alison share similar concerns, though the objects they study are not precisely the same. Among many of the things Alquier, who, let us not forget, was an adamant Cartesian, showed his French readers, one of the most striking was that Spinoza's method is not as clean and simple as its crystalline geometric shape might otherwise lead us to believe. It is, on the contrary, quite opaque. Alquier takes as an example the fact that Spinoza sometimes feels it necessary to offer a second, third, or even a fourth demonstration of one single theorem or proposition, when in fact one single demonstration suffices unto itself to prove a proposition mathematically speaking. Alquier's point is that Spinoza's system does not and furthermore cannot live up to the expectations of a genuinely Euclidean mathematical model, because Spinoza's thought is too fractured, too multifaceted, and too genuinely philosophical, in spite of itself, as it were. Um, Charles and I have often talked about this, and he, he likes to call this the anatomist's approach to Spinoza, as opposed to the surgeon's approach. A surgeon, like Giroux, for example, may make local incisions onto, into his patient, but the goal is to save the whole and preserve its overall well-being, its internal coherence. Alquier, anatomist, is happy cutting up and dissecting and taking apart the dead body on the table, seeing what pieces were really in there all along. And we, we also have an ongoing debate about whether Deleuze is more of an anatomist or a surgeon. And Charles believes he's a surgeon because Deleuze's whole enterprise is to protect Spinoza. Spinoza is always right. And I think Deleuze is rather uh, more of an anatomist in the sense that he, he shows us the ethics, although it doesn't exist. There's no such thing as the ethics. It's, it's, it's actually a book he decomposes. So um, we disagree on that. But the, the example could be found maybe discussed otherwise. So I think, anyway, that by showing us how multifaceted Spinoza's arguments are with respect to the embodiment question, and by demonstrating that Spinoza, in fact, does not have one, but has two theories of embodiment, parallelism and the idea of theory, the former being born from a metaphysical approach, an abstract consideration of the nature of the relationship of attributes and substance, the latter from an intuition, I quote Allison, that there is a certain kind of awareness or distinctively mental representationality in God's ideas, which our ideas inherit. Representationality in a sense that at least sometimes involves awareness being a basic property of God. So I think that by showing this, Allison is going much in the same direction as Alquier, though she may not share his sweeping claims about Spinozism in general. As she herself adeptly points out, we may, though, when grappling with the embodiment question, 
be in fact grappling with the consequences of a very deep and basic rift driving Spinoza's system. I would like now, with my remaining time, to zoom out, like I said before, and attempt to put the embodiment question into a larger perspective, somewhat um, for the sake of the non-specialist. Let me, therefore, first of all, try my best to rephrase Allison's embodiment question as follows. If the nature of any body as a body has nothing to do with the nature of any mind as mind, since these two are modes of two distinct and incommensurable attributes, why is it then that my mind gives me ideas of, effect, ideas of, ideas of affections of my body? i.e. my body's states, qualities, or properties. So given that Spinoza raises this question just after having demonstrated that the order and the connection of ideas is the same as the order and connection of things, it would only be natural to imagine that he hoped to use this parallelism framework to explain mind-body relations or embodiment. And indeed, throughout the ethics, Spinoza will appeal to the parallelism of the attributes to say a good deal about embodiment or mind-body relations. It lets him say such things as, for example, the body cannot determine the mind to thinking, the mind cannot determine the body to motion, to rest, or to anything else. But that there is only one and the same causal structure of reality, or only one and the same power of God, does not, upon further inspection, really say much about why ideas are ideas of things, i.e., why ideas represent things. Allison has, by taking apart Spinoza's text, proven that this is the case. The parallelism of the attributes is not used by Spinoza to explain why mental representation amounts to the ideas of feelings, affects, or bodily affections, and that the content of our minds, oh, I think we should just call it consciousness, consists of such awareness of feelings or affections. And this is what I would call the difference between there being an idea for account of mind-body relations, neatly founded by parallelism, there is an idea for every body, the mind, that has as much reality as the body, and which causally interacts with other ideas exactly as the body causally interacts with other bodies by the same order and connection, and there being an idea of account of mind-body relations, that there is an idea of my body, and the content of my mind consists of this idea. It would seem like, logically at least, there must be in the first place an idea for a body, for there ever to be an idea of it, but that there are ideas for bodies does not adequately explain the very thing that needs explaining in order to propose an idea of a of embodiment. And the only explanation on hand, as Allison shows us, is that we inherit from God his infinite representational capacity, i.e. that for anything he has an idea of it. This account of embodiment, of the embodiment question, in terms of an idea of relationship between mind and body, is immensely important. For one thing, it allows Spinoza to then ask another question evidently larger in scope. Why is it that, paradoxically, when I have ideas of other bodies in mind, I really, in fact, am forming an idea of my body insofar as it is affected by these other bodies. And since to have an idea of a body is to have an idea of its causes or what explains its properties, why is it that when I have an idea of my own body, what I'm also actually doing is perceiving or contemplating the ways in which other bodies are affecting my own body? Last of all, what does this doubly paradoxical nature of embodiment say about the possibility of our forming adequate or true ideas. Spinoza's aim is to demonstrate that the more my body interacts with other bodies and is diversely affected by them, the more my mind will have ideas of my body and of other bodies via my body, of their various agreements, and of what is indeed truly useful. If you look at E2, P13, Scolium, the point is made abundantly clear. I say this in general, right, Spinoza, that in proportion as a body is more capable than others of doing many things at once, or being acted on in many ways at once, so its mind is more capable than others of perceiving many things at once. Again, the point is that the more varied are the affections of my body, the more my mind has ideas or is perceiving many things at once. And the more my, my mind has ideas, the more material it will be able to work with as it strives to piece together an adequate, complete, and exhaustive understanding of things. <coughs> Furthermore, we can say that insofar as the idea of a concept embodiment is used by Spinoza to describe how mental content or consciousness consists of representations of the body and its affections, and since the body and its affections are always, for Spinoza, caught up in a network of relations with other bodies and their affections, therefore, Spinoza's conception of the mind involves, at this level, at its very foundation, a description of the mind's interactivity, and at this level, he is obviously profoundly anti-Cartesian. In short, it's because the mind is an idea of the body and its affections that the mind can, in fact, have a great range of representability or a wealth of mental content. But it's because there is an idea for the body, that is the mind, that the mind does not lose itself, as it were, in this vast horizon, and rather remains anchored, as Allison has written. 
Still, even if, as I think, Spinoza hopes later to package these two back together into one story of things, which I think him to be doing at E2, P13, Swim, among other places, Allison's demonstration seems pretty much waterproof. There's no evident way to get from parallelism to the idea of a comp of mind and body relation in Spinoza. The order of reasons, as Adkier has already showed us, is not so neat after all. An idea of a kind of embodiment, where the mind consists of representations of the body's affections, seems to depend on something intuitive, perhaps, and felt and lived, as Descartes himself maintained, as Adkier would have been most certainly happy to hear, and as Allison has underlined once more. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Jeff.